Hey everybody, welcome to another It's Live live show, which I have titled, I don't remember. <laughs> I titled it, We Can Do It. <laughs> I titled it that because I was just in Cannes, which is in France. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. I had a whole bunch of things go horribly wrong just before the stream started, uh, unsurprisingly. I don't know how the stream started. For you folks, there should have been a little greeting card at the beginning, and then I appeared. But that's not what YouTube told me. YouTube is changing its software for doing live streaming, so that keeps things interesting. Let's roll into this though. And of course, let me know in the comments if everything's okay or if things are horribly wrong. If you can't see anything, if the sound's bad, you know, who knows? You let me know. I did notice a few, a few people chatting in the stream already, trying to guess what plaid I would be wearing. Surprise! No plaid today. See, you just can't, you can't predict me. I'm unpredictable. I'm wearing my secret cabal shirt. <laughs> The uh, honorary founder shirt, you can pick these up from the Seeker Cabal. I should have put a link in the description below, but I forgot to. Search for the Seeker Cabal online, you'll, you'll find them. All right, let me know though, again in the chat, is the audio okay? Just let me, let me know, please. Remember, we're gonna try to do these live shows every second Wednesday, uh, which we won't be doing <laughs> two weeks from now <laughs> because everything I say in the live stream is wrong. Uh, I'm going to be traveling. I'm actually going to be in, uh, well, let's see, I'm going to Los Angeles for a couple of days, and then I'm going to Reno, so I won't be around to do a live show. But the following Wednesday, which is March 18th, yes, we'll be back for another live show. Remember, if you would like to ask a question in the live stream, the way to do it, I'm going to show you a little example, is to do it like this. Write QUESTION in all caps and then ask your question. That way, I can see the questions a little easier. Actually, getting a little help behind the scenes. Uh, Andrea is watching the stream right now, my daughter, and she's gonna keep an eye out for those questions and paste them into a little Google Doc for me so I won't have to go sifting through the chat to find the questions. We're gonna see if this little improvement to the technology will actually be an improvement or just more chaotic. Who knows, I never know with these things. Oh, I wanna mention, we're gonna have a contest. Contest during this episode, I'll make this very quick. Um, I'm gonna give away a copy of The Mind. If you'd like to win a copy of this game, you'll find a link in the description below. It is gonna take you to a spot where you just have to enter just a couple of details so I can reach you if you want. And along with that, you have to put in a code word. And the code word will be the first name of the person who designed this game. So put that code word in. We'll do the draw at the end of this episode so we'll see who the winner was before you leave here. But a little contest for those of you who joined us early, right? Okay. Contest of the way. I want to talk about Super Chats. Let's get this question out of, out of the way. Gone. Or other side. Gone. Um, we have a, a Super Chat that came in last time during the live stream. I didn't see it until I was going back through the live show later. Super Chats are supposed to be so super that you can't miss them. Guess what? I missed it. I missed two of them, actually. So I'm going to answer those right off the top here. So to do this, we're going to go over to the Super Chat chair. What's the Super Chat chair, you say? It's, well, it's not really anything <laughs> that spectacular, but join me over there right now. We're going to the Super Chat chair. I'm going as quickly as I can. Okay, we're in the Super Chat chair now, and I got a question here from Sam, who's uh, got a YouTube channel called Lord of the Board. It's been going for a while now. He just hit 1,000 subscribers. Congratulations, Sam. That's awesome. And he wanted to ask me, he said, do you have tips for smaller channels? I thought this was an interesting question because... Um, you know, uh, people, there's a lot of people right now starting in, in the hobby and are interested in creating content on YouTube and maybe at the beginning, just like me, didn't have a lot of subscribers and they just want a few tips. So I thought I would share a, a couple of pieces of advice that I, I thought might be useful maybe to you, Sam, or other people who might be thinking about creating content online, whether it's for board games or anything, I suppose. I think this could apply. I'll try to keep this quick because I know this won't be relevant to everyone, but Sam, you gave a super chat. I want to answer your question. So one of the first things that I need to do at the beginning was decide <laughs> who I wanted to be. And I don't mean uh, adopting a persona for the camera. I mean what was going to be important to me in how I came across to the audience. What, was, what were my priorities? And to help me formulate that, I wrote these, which are, uh, I've talked about these before. They're what I call Rodney's Rules, because I like alliteration, or a little subtitle here, The Guiding Principles of Watch It Played. And I wrote this I wrote this within like the first month of starting the channel. I wrote some before and I wrote some after I got sort of started. And these are about, well, there are 19 little rules I wrote for myself just to be kind of, again, guiding principles 
as I moved forward, I tried to think about what's important to me. What are some <laughs> basically tips and tricks for myself? Uh, you know, because I knew that if I kept doing this and I enjoyed doing it, I want to keep doing it. And I would encounter situations that I'd never encountered before, and I wouldn't know exactly how to deal with them unless I had something to guide sort of my decision-making process. I'll just read out, I'll, look, I'll read a couple of these out to you. I'll read six of them just to give you a sense of the sort of things I was trying to decide for myself. So number one, I make videos, so this is something I wrote, I make videos for individuals watching, not to grow my channel views and subscriptions. The important thing, of course, people would like to grow their channel views and subscriptions, but the thing I wanted to prioritize was remembering that I am creating these videos for individual people who are watching. I never wanted to treat the people who are watching the channel as this nameless mass of people. They are all individual people who are watching. They're gonna have their own interests and needs and wants and desires and all the rest of it. And I wanted as much as possible make what I was creating come across as if I was talking to you as an individual person, not just another nameless person. So that was one of the Rodney rules. Number two, I make videos for a variety of different viewers. Be thoughtful about your use of pronouns. Three, if you respect people, they will, on balance, respect you. You know, I knew I was going to be, if, as I continued to do this, I'd be interacting with more and more people, both in person and just online, sort of the way we're interacting here. And I didn't know what kind of situations I was going to run into. Without going too deep into this, I can say that this particular rule that I wrote out uh, has proven to be true for the most part. If you respect people, they will, on balance, not everyone, but on balance, most people will respect you back. Number four, I will strive to make time to respond to people who take the time to write to me in any form. So whether it's in the comments or on social media and Twitter, Facebook, it's emails, whatever the case may be, if someone reaches out and contacts me, I wanted to try to make as a guiding principle that I would get back to them. Uh, I, I think that rule came about because I remember as I started to become aware of YouTube back in 2011, I mean, I knew about YouTube before 2011, but that's when I was really starting to get more active on it. I would look in the comments of videos and see all these questions and comments and interactions happening from people trying to talk to the content creator and it was dead silence. And I wrote some of my own comments to YouTubers that I liked or respected and again, dead silence. And I thought, is, is it possible to have a little bit more of a back and forth? I wanted to try and that's something I've strived to do. Number five, I don't know the person behind a negative comment. Kindness is always the best response. This is just, I knew walking onto the internet, I'm gonna be dealing with strangers. Uh, some of them over time would go from being strangers to acquaintances, some, sometimes even friends. But I knew I was gonna encounter some negativity at, at certain points along the way, and I, I wanted to have a strategy in mind for how I was gonna deal with it. And I decided that being kind to people, or at the very least, uh, ignoring, <laughs> which is a form of kindness in some cases, was the, was the best way of, of treating it. And some of these used to be longer, and I've kind of shortened them down over time. But the, the key thing is I don't know the person behind a negative comment. I don't know their situation. I don't know what went on in their day that day. I don't know how old they are. I don't know their mental state. I think it's very tempting when you get a negative comment to imagine them as a, as a peer, and that can really twist you up in your mind. Because if a peer was criticizing me or saying something negative, I might want to try to respond to them, engage with them, and convince them otherwise. Whereas if it was somebody, I don't know, who was like nine years old, <laughs> you know, or, or just was having the worst day of their life, I might not feel as compelled to try to like rationalize what I was doing with them, right? So just remember, Rodney, you don't know who those people are, all, you know, so don't take it too personally. And the, the sixth thing here, the designer, artist, editor, publisher, distributor has put thousands of hours into their game, therefore I can take the time to refilm a section of video that can be improved. Look, sometimes when I've been recording all day long, shooting something, and I'll find out, oh, there's a mistake, or there's an issue, and I think, well, you know, is anyone really going to notice? And this was a little guiding principle to say, Rodney, it doesn't matter whether somebody else notices or not. The people you're working with have put lots of time and energy into their craft, you can do the same. So look, there's a bunch more. I'm not going to waste your time reading them all out to you, but these are just little things that I found helpful to me starting out. And I think as a small channel or whatever you are, it's good to have a list of, of, of principles. Who are you and what are you trying to be and what do you want to be? Aim for something that is sort of aspirational. Um, okay, a few more bullet points here. Um, also decide what you want. Are your goals for your channel, are they internal or external? Some people's goals are going to be more external. Maybe they want fame. Maybe they want to uh, get to know distributors and publishers. Maybe they want to have a certain place of prominence in the hobby. I, I don't know. I know but those are kind of more external goals. Internal goals, I think, are more like I have, a, I have a desire to get something creative out of me, or I want to create X number of videos, or I really want to see this type of content being created because I don't see anyone else doing it. Those are more like internal goals. I think you also have to balance 
expectations against your goals so that you can course correct. Because maybe you really want to do one thing, but it's not working. Well, get ready to adjust to maybe try to do something else if it's not working. Or maybe your goals aren't healthy. You know, they're causing you stress. Maybe you need to course correct in that way. I also think setting goals that you have control over is a big deal. I see this quite frequently. People say, oh, my goal is to have 2,000 subscribers by the end of the year. Okay, but you don't have any control over that. You can't control whether or not you'll have 2,000 subscribers by the end of the year. Yes, you can do certain things to help encourage it happening, but you can't control it. So my advice is to create goals that you can control. Rodney, you are going to create one video per week, or maybe your goal is every two weeks, or maybe it's I want to create three different styles. I want to create, you know, two different styles of videos that I release a month, or it's just something to do with consistency or control or level of quality you want to put out there. Those are things you do have control over and that you can look back on and go, I accomplished what I set out to do. I like goals like that. I think, uh, look, if you're trying to grow your channel, one thing to consider is picking popular topics. <laughs> are you covering things that people want to see? If so, it increases the odds that your audience will grow. On the other hand, to counteract that, niche uh, things can, be, can generate really loyal viewers. So maybe doing something a little more obscure could be successful. But I, I think on balance, generally, Going with things that are slightly more popular will help you grow, especially in the early stages. Uh, be a part of the community. You know, get yourself out there on social media or in other circles where people are out there interacting and talking about the things that you're interested in and become an active member of that community. Don't just do it to seek out connections or business connections. I think it's definitely better if you're a little more authentic and you just actually desire to be a member of the community. People have been watching my channel from the beginning, well, no, one of the things I said over and over and over again about the reason why I wanted to make videos is because I felt so disconnected from the board gaming community because I live in this small little town and I hoped that by making videos I could start to reach out and make those connections because I kind of crave that. And uh, I can say that that is certainly something that I've been able to benefit from from doing this and I'm really grateful for that. Uh, share your videos where gamers are. So get on BGG, get on Board Game Reddit, find places people are looking for things. If you're making videos about a particular type of game, find those groups on Facebook, post them there. Don't give up. That's the other thing. If you're enjoying what you're doing, if you're finding it fulfilling, don't give up just because you're maybe a small channel now. Because if you're doing good quality work that people have an interest in seeing, the trend on your channel, I believe, will always be like this. Now, it might not be like this, <laughs> but it will be onwards and upwards, I believe. That's what I've seen over and over and over again. Consistent, good quality work will be re rewarded, but it might take some time. Last but not least, uh, here's another tip, collaborate. Um, you know, that, that might, uh, might be a way to help grow your channel as well. Find other people that do things that you're doing that you find creative ways to collaborate with and then try to reach out to them and see if they'd like to. I get, <laughs> I get people reaching out to me with some frequency. Unfortunately, right now I'm so busy, I haven't been able to take people up on a lot of those opportunities, but I've always enjoyed collaborating with other people when I can make the time. It's creatively rewarding for me and it's also, it can be helpful. It can help get your content in front of other people's eyes who maybe haven't seen it before. And that can be fun to do too. And speaking of which, uh, Lord of the Board, I just want to give you a quick plug. If you haven't heard of his channel before, check it out. Sam's got a great channel. His videos, a lot of them have to do with strategy guides. Uh, he's got one for Root and for Villainous where he goes through the different characters and factions and tells you, hey, here's strategies to consider. Sam's got a lot of really positive energy. When you watch, you'll see it right away. He's got like this very, I think, infectious kind of enthusiastic presentation. But it's also coupled with really interesting information and great visuals. And I think, Sam, over time, again, the direction for you, I think, is going to be this way. So keep it up. If you're enjoying it and you find it satisfying, fulfilling, which I hope you do, then keep at it. I think you'll, you'll find a lot of success along the way. Again, define that success for yourself, though. It might not be an external thing, like success for me is I want to be like the most popular YouTuber ever. Maybe success is I want to feel fulfilled in what I'm doing. And I, I think goals like that tend to be a little easier to satisfy. I had one other uh, super chat, by the way, that I didn't get to last time. It was from Jennifer Sims. And I don't think she had a question, just said it had a nice comment. So I just want to say to you, Jennifer, thank you for the nice comment and thank you for the support. Let's get back over to the other chair and we'll continue our conversation. Thanks again for the super chats and let's get over there. I'm just realizing I don't have a button that I can click that will just switch the scene. So <laughs> here we go. And I also realized I've been away from the chat. So if the stream went down, I've just been talking to myself for the last little while, but hopefully, hopefully that's not the case. Let's see. No, I think everything's, everything's fine from what I can tell. All right, let's see if there's any other things here that I wanted to mention. Oh, I want to mention quickly, there are a few different ways you can support the channel. I'll make this very quick. It's a little sort of support plug here. 
in the description below, you'll find where you can pick up Kurds shirts, K-E-R-D-S. This is a little collaboration with Dragon's Tomb. You can pick those up there. Also, Pod Pledge promos. There's a link. You can find promos from our previous fundraisers. And if you'd like to support the show, picking up a couple of those is a great way to do it. And also, again, Super Chats here in the live stream is a great way to do it. There's a little Super Chat button. It's like a little dollar sign. You ask your question there, I'll jump back over to the Super Chat chair and I'll answer it there. But you don't have to pay money to ask questions. You can just ask questions. And I showed you how to do that at the beginning of the, uh, the show here. All right, let's jump into a couple of things I wanted to talk about. One of them, actually, here's a comment that I got from Wave Winder. This was on our BGG Guild. They said, it was great to see you on the Dice Tower recently. Do you have any more collaborations with them or others coming up in the near future? Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you saying that. It was really nice to, uh, of Tom and Z and, and the crew there to have me down. I had a lot of fun with them. And uh, I enjoyed the, the videos that we made. We did a board game breakfast. We did a top 10 about uh, most anticipated games for 2020. And we did another top 10, which I was really excited to be doing, which was called The Enemies of Gaming, where we listed some of the things that can kind of impede our enjoyment in the hobby and challenges to the hobby. And I should have put both of those or all of those linked in the description below. I will do that after the stream is over. But if you go to the Dice Tower and just search for top 10 enemies of gaming, they did this topic before. So look for the one that says in the thumbnail with Rodney Smith or with Watch It Played. And uh, that's the one that uh, I participated in. But uh, while I was there, um, here's a little picture <laughs> from my time with them. Uh, on screen, it was Tom, Z, and myself. And uh, we, had a, we had a pretty good time joking around and, and talking about the various topics. Speaking of joking around, um, I, uh, I expressed to them that I need to go use the bathroom, so they pointed me in the direction of the bathroom. And I went in there, and I turned on the light. This is what greeted me. Uh, I didn't realize they were <laughs> prepared for this and took a picture at the time, but <laughs> I near jumped out of my skin. There was a dummy in the bathroom <laughs> with a scary face pulled over its head. Oh, anyone else is going to the... Um, Dice Tower for anything, just beware. Uh, they, they, they will try to prank you. And after, after we did our recordings there, we, we sat down and played a game called Dominations. This is something that Tom was, a, a game that Tom was really excited about. And we had a fun time playing that, and then that sort of wrapped up the day. We sort of shot all three of those things in one day, and then I turned around and came right back. So no plans to do another collaboration with the Dice Tower anytime soon, but if the opportunity comes up, I would certainly consider it. That said, when I go to Los Angeles, Next week, I'm going to be visiting the Game Night crew, and we're going to be recording some videos there, uh, playing some different games for their Game Night channel. So I, I don't know exactly when those will, will release. They generally tend to space them out over time, sprinkle them out throughout the year, but we'll probably record maybe five or six gameplays of things. And I'm going to be bringing a couple of games. I'll have a couple of games there, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Oh, the other thing that, that went on is uh, I kind of titled this we can do it because I was in France recently at the Cannes Festival de Jeu, or Festival International de Jeu. This is a big gaming convention that I don't feel like most people in North America really know about. <laughs> I mean, I think last year they had 110,000 attendees. Now, that I don't believe is unique attendees. That's sort of like turnstiles maybe. But I'll tell you, when I was there, I felt like it was almost as busy as any one of the bigger conventions. Like, bigger than Origins, maybe not as big as Gen Con, but somewhere in between those ranges. That's what it felt like uh, in terms of the crowds of people and just the tons of publishers that were there. Not only that, Cannes is a beautiful location. <laughs> this, is, this is where we were. Uh, it's kind of beautiful being, uh, you know, by the water. The temperature was beautiful. It was really, really awesome. I, I spent most of my time in the convention hall, which is typically what happens when, when I go on these trips. But it was nice. The day before, I got to go out and actually sort of explore around and be a tourist, and we had a, a really great time. Went over to this little island. It's called uh, Ile de Marguerite, I believe, and they have lots of great walking trails. They had this really cool old fort where the man in the Iron Mask was kept. I thought that was just a fictional story. It turns out there was actually a historical basis for that, was, which was then fictionalized later. That was really cool, and something kind of bizarre happened. I was uh, with uh, one of the other folks from BGG, uh, Beth, and we were walking along this, this sort of beachy trail, and she was finding beach glass. And I looked down, and I found something that wasn't beach glass, but that was kind of appropriate for a gamer to find, I think. I found a hotel from Monopoly, if you can believe it. <laughs> so go figure, the gamer finds a gaming piece. I don't know how it got there. I'm kind of imagining that someone was playing... Uh, 
game of Monopoly that went just too long and they were by the beach and they just turfed the whole thing into the ocean <laughs> and then it just came across the island and washed ashore? Maybe? I don't know. But uh, the reason I was really at, at Cannes was because we were there, uh, I was there with BGG and we were recording a bunch of previews of games there. So those will be going up on the BGG Express YouTube channel if you want to see some of the games that were announced there. And you know, it was interesting being at this convention because predominantly everyone there is speaking French. The publishers there are French. It was kind of weird in a way to go to all these booths that I'm north to, used to seeing at other conventions and not recognizing anyone in those booths, <laughs> you know? Even when I go to uh, Essenspiel, typically I'm used to seeing several people that I see at the North American conventions there, but not here. It was like a whole different universe. And it was a really neat experience though. It was uh, interesting to see and, and everyone was really great and very kind and, and very um, patient with the uh, non French speaking English person in their presence. Uh, many of the people there did know English, so that made it much easier to, uh, to get along and carry on with people. All right, well, I think it's time to start answering some of your questions that you've put here in the, in the comments. And let's see, Andrea, if you've collected a few for me. As I mentioned, Andrea is helping me collect some questions. I see, oh, yes, there's a, there's, a, there's a bunch sitting here. I better get started. I think this particular live show, normally I have a game that we play or other things. This one, I'm just going to focus on your questions. I'm going to do my best to answer them as thoroughly but as quickly as possible. And I also have some questions here from the BGG Guild as well. So if we run out of questions, which I don't think will happen, um, we have these as well. Okay. Robert Christ asks, theoretically, you go to Origins this summer, and theoretically, we run into each other, would you actually play Above and Below with me and two other people we randomly ask? Well, Robert, I appreciate you asking this question. It's a great question to ask on the live stream because I do get asked from time to time when I'm going to a convention and someone knows I'm going there, hey, Rodney, would you consider playing a game with me? I always have to say, I mean, it's, it's a mixed answer. Yes, I would consider, but don't bet on it. It's not because of a lack of desire. It's just my time at conventions are so unpredictable. I never want to try to schedule something. I don't even barely schedule things with people I do know <laughs> at conventions, including like publishers. Publishers will reach out and say, hey, can we have a meeting at such and such a time? And I'm usually like, I can't bank that I'll be available for that time. So it's better to sort of like just go, I think it's better for me to go with the flow and see what happens and what can happen. But typically I don't schedule time to play games at conventions. So that's kind of the, the short answer of it. But I hope, I always hope that no one would ever take it personal. Like, oh, Rodney thinks he's too good to play games with me. No, it's just that my schedule is unpredictable and it's just tough. It's just tough to sort of square time away to play games. Now, there are certain conventions where it's more likely that I'll be playing games than others. For example, at BGG Spring, that's a convention where I, I do more game playing. But at other conventions, usually I've got work that I'm doing with the, with the show. So Robert Christ had another question. Regarding your including Z and Tom, come on comments and their lag on delivering Kickstarter games, how worried should I be about their current Marvel United projects and a uh, bunch of minis, I think? Um, I don't remember exactly what I said during that. I, I might have commented that, yes, uh, see, uh, come on, Simon, uh, sometimes get behind on their projects. But it's pretty typical when you have large projects for there to be some delay. I think they're generally pretty good. It's also kind of a personal thing, right? Because some people are going to be bothered by a delay more than others. I personally don't mind if a game is a month or two or three delayed because I have lots of other games <laughs> that I can be playing. So I don't mind waiting. I, as long as you know, they're working on the game and they're improving it, then I, I, I don't mind the delay. But everyone, of course, is going to be a little different that way. All right, Percy's, doing more game nights in LA? Well, Percy's, yes, yes I am. So <laughs> as, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'll be doing uh, five or six more, I think. Maybe more, I don't know. Um, we, we did about eight or nine last time and it was a lot. It was maybe like almost too much. So I think, because the problem is, you're, if you're recording game nights back to back to back to back, you know, it's difficult to maintain that energy level when you're doing it in such a compressed time. Because yes, you're, you're sitting there and you're playing a game, sure, but there's a technical aspect of it that's going on behind the scenes. And as the day drags on, that can, you know, that, uh, that can wear you down a little bit. And we want to keep the, the energy high and, and, and good and positive, right? So probably aim for more like five or six this time. We'll see. Uh, Riel would like to know, how often do I play GW games? Now, I assume you're asking this because GW games tend to be a little more involved, uh, especially their miniatures line games. Not frequently is my answer, unfortunately, because I really like their games. And one in particular, Warcry, I would say is my favorite miniatures game 
of all time right now. The last time I played that was in November and I had a fantastic time playing it. Another great game that a breakout from them is uh, Blitz Bowl. That one's a lot easier to break out and play than some of the others, but right now I'm very much in a shooting tutorial videos mode plus travel. So I'm not getting as much time to go back and play older titles that I, I quite enjoy. So that'll happen more. And again, like I said, at BGG Spring and some of those trips, that's where I sometimes break out games that I don't get a chance to play to as much at home. Dave Zokvik would like to know, will you be changing your branding to Watch It Plaid for April Fools? Dave, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> now that you've announced it, I guess I can't do that, but that, that, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, so Austin Carpenter would like to know, have you thought of doing a review or a how to play of Twilight Imperium 4? Well, I haven't thought of doing a review because I don't review here on the channel. Have I thought about doing a how to play? Well, guess what? I've never even played Twilight Imperium. So I, I don't pre-announce on this channel games I may or may not do because my schedule can change and I don't like to disappoint. Uh, I know it's a very popular game, and I definitely uh, like going back and covering games that are sort of proven to be classics, I guess, even if they're kind of modern classics. Games like Terraforming Mars, for example, I did a couple of years, if not more, after it already released. But it's a game that people are still playing and very invested in, so my belief was that a tutorial video could still continue to be helpful to people, not just now and in the past, but well into the future, hopefully. So, Tuckleberry Finn asked, have you considered doing solo overviews for your Watch It Played videos? It seems like a lot of games are including solo rule sets now. I've certainly considered it. In a couple of places I've done it, there was a game, Legacy of the Testament of Duke de Crecy, where I did both the sort of multiplayer or the, the norm, normal rules. I don't mean that solo rules are abnormal, but hopefully you get what I'm saying. Uh, those rules, and then I did a separate video for the solo rules, but that is the exception uh, to the rule. I... I want my rules videos to be as concise and as comprehensive as possible, and I feel like you know, the two to six player version of the rules is generally the core concepts of the game, and then variants or solo rules are additional things. And given my schedule, I don't feel like, I, for me personally, I don't really want to dedicate the time to covering the solo component as well. And I know there's lots of people who are really into solo rules and playing games solo. Now I will cover games where the entire game is solo. And then, of course, all the rules you're getting are the solo rules. I don't mind doing that, but I prefer to sort of, what I think is set you up to learn the solo rules much easier by having done the, the main video. And then hopefully it's just a couple more pages of rules you have to read to understand the solo, solo aspect of the game. And a lot of these rules you can find available online for free. So after you've watched my video, if you wanted to pop open the rules PDF, you could then just read the couple of pages or a couple of paragraphs that go with the solo rules and then hopefully get a very good sense of what the game would be like solo. Jackie uh, would like to know, what books have you enjoyed recently? Oh, man, I wish I could go grab this book. I'm going to go grab the book. Okay, this, I should never do this. You're, I'm leaving you with a blank screen, <laughs> an empty chair. I'm going to be quick. I'm going to be super quick. i got to run, all, I gotta run two flights of stairs. One second. Okay, this is a book that was uh, given to me by a friend of mine. And uh, it's related to my interest in the magic hobby. I mean, I'm going so far, I might even lose microphone connection. I'm not sure. Hopefully not. All right, we're almost to my bedroom. One sec. Okay, there's the book. Yeah, got it in my hand. All right. Now, the question, though, was what book have I been enjoying reading recently? And uh, frankly, I haven't been reading much other than rule books. I did just finish the first book in the Foundation series, which I read when I was younger, and I just re read. But this right here, okay, thanks Jackie so much for this question. Oh, this is Dunninger's, Dunninger's Complete Encyclopedia of Magic. So magic has been a little bit of a, a side hobby for me lately. I'm no magician, but I do like learning about it and, and spending money on buying magic tricks and learning how they work. Um, this is such a fantastic book. So a friend of mine found this in a used bookstore and mailed it to me. And I'm just going to show you. Unfortunately, I can't bring the, the camera closer. It's going it's to get out of focus, as you can see here, right? But hopefully you can tell from here. This is like, look at the small print on this thing. This is like vaudeville magic. This is old-timey magic with all these awesome, fantastic illustrations. This is, I mean, this is like stage magic, along with like close-up. Uh, but a lot of performance magic here, and it's just really great. I love the illustrations. I love the breakdowns. Oh, there's a playing card in here. I use jokers as uh, bookmarks. 
Anyway, um, this is sort of what I'm picking through slowly here and there when I get a, t a chance to read, and I'm, I'm just just loving it. Such a, such a cool uh, and unexpected gift to get. All right. Um, Robert Christ would like to know, how do you discern your feelings when desiring buying a game? I play games and enjoy them, but also think I must buy them. I'm doing my first call because these 30 plus games I'm not, because there's 30 plus games I'm not keen on anymore. How do you discern your feelings when desiring buying a game? Um, I just, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just much harsher these days. Uh, I think about my time is what I often do. I think, Rodney, this game looks awesome. Do you have time and the people to play this game with? If the answer is no, it doesn't matter how awesome and cool that game looks. I, I try not to buy it. I try to think about things that sort of fit my lifestyle where I am in my life right now. So, big, involved games don't have as much space in my world right now as they once did. Uh, they still appeal to me, they still look cool to me, but I'm at a period right now where it doesn't make sense for me to invest the time in them, really. Um, now, if I'm considering a game for the show, that's a different matter, because in those, those situations I'm looking at and going, do I think this would appeal to my audience, or would it be of interest to people? Uh, those are things that, that um, uh, <laughs> I'm just seeing a super chat come in. <laughs> oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disappoint. I'm going to go to the super chat. So, Robert Christ, I hope I've kind of answered your question there. I, I, I call my collection, I'm trying to get it down, down, down. I have a collection, I used to have a collection of about six to 700 games, I now have it down to about 300 and, 350 or maybe it's actually, no, it's closer to 320. And I think about how many days there are in the year, 365. I don't play a game every day. So I, can't even, I couldn't even play my entire collection in one year. I couldn't even probably play half my collection in one year. So to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I want games on my shelf that I can play and, and will play on an ongoing basis. And so having thousands of games, just I know I wouldn't be playing them. Now, that's me. Somebody else, they want to have a big giant collection of games, that's cool. But for me, I'm trying to get my collection into a more playable state, I guess you could say. All right, so I'm gonna go over to the, <laughs> the chair and I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a very disappointing answer for Jennifer Sims. All right, here we go. Over to the super chat chair. So Jennifer Sims, would like to know, Rodney, would you perform a magic trick for us? Um, <laughs> no, but I will tell you a magic trick story. So when I was at Cannes, there was a reception after what is basically the Spiel de Jarus over there in France. And after, during the reception, I, I ran to a couple of people I had met while I was at the show, a couple of fantastic guys from a YouTube channel called A2 Games, in French, E-T, and then T-U, and then Games. And uh, we were bantering, it was just nice to see some familiar faces. And we've been talking a little bit about magic on uh, earlier in the show, and they said, oh, you know, I've got any magic tricks with you, uh, or, yeah, I think they did ask me, I don't think I just foisted them on them. And I said, well, you know what, I actually do have a couple magic tricks with me. So I broke out one that I have been doing since I sort of first really got back into magic. I know it like the back of my hand, you know, it works every time. I do the trick, it involves revealing two cards that should match. He flips over his card, I flip over mine, they don't match. Okay, <laughs> it sucks when a magic trick goes poorly, especially when you're doing it in front of people you don't really know. And remember, we're in a reception. So I'm, I'm hamming it up a little bit. I'm starting to play it up and, and people are gathering around. So we've got a small, a small little audience uh, around the table where I'm, I'm doing this. And it's bomb. Now I had a little out here because the, uh, the trick is actually called the test. So I went, well, you know what? Look, it's a test and sometimes Sometimes tests work out, sometimes they don't. But you know what? Instead of doing a test, let me do a magic trick for you. So here I am trying to cover for myself. And uh, so, hey, look, that little thing we just did, that was nothing. Internally, I'm like crying. But externally, I'm like, it's fine. That, that was a test. Let me do an actual magic trick. So now I'm going to save myself. I'm going to do, I got two packs of cards. I know this trick like, guess what? The back of my hand. Done this a million times. It's never failed. I'm going to do this. I'm going to wow them. I'm going to recover. It's another one of these tricks we're going to reveal, each reveal a card and they're going to match. We reveal, they do not match. At that point, I, all I wanted in the world was for all the cells in my body to separate and just go off in completely different directions. I wanted, to, I wanted Thanos to snap his fingers and I wanted to just be dusted. I wanted to just disappear. I was devastated. But of course, I couldn't show that. So then I had a decision to make. Was I going to do another trick and potentially bomb it? How do I escape? The trap door didn't open. I haven't disappeared into the ground yet. 
oh my goodness. So at this point, I had to find another route. So I go, you know what? Look, it's clear what the problem is here. It's you. <laughs> I turned it off the person I was doing the performance for. I said, two for two. I haven't had any success with you. I think it might be you. Hey, would you like me to do a trick for you? <laughs> so then I do another trick. It works. So I go, look, I think clearly it was this other guy. That was the problem. Uh, you know, anyway, it was, um, it was miserable. <laughs> I didn't show that, but I felt so terrible. I mean, because magic is creating an illusion for someone. It's effectively lying to somebody, but hopefully in an entertaining way. And when you bomb, you're just being a bad liar. And um, it feels terrible. I, just was, I decided, you know, I'm going to go back to my room. I'm going to burn all the magic tricks I have. I'm going to go home. I'm going to throw them all in the garbage. And I'm going to go on with my life, and, and my life will be much joy, more joyful because of it. Well, after about five or six hours, <laughs> I recovered, and I'm back to enjoying and loving magic again. Whew. That's the thing, though. With magic, you've got to practice, yes, at home and in private, but you kind of have to do it in front of people and, uh, and fail a few times to figure out how to get better. So hopefully that's what this means. I'm maybe a little better now than I was before. All right, so we're back to the non-Super Chat chair. Thank you, Jennifer, for the question. Hope you enjoyed the little, little story. Maybe, maybe someday I'll prepare a magic trick for the, for the live show. I don't know. It's one thing to crash and burn in front of seven or eight people. It's another thing to crash and burn in front of a, a much larger crowd. So, um, yeah, we'll see. Okay, let me, uh, let me go back to your, uh, your questions here. Ella Loves Board Games says... Have you had any comments that made you break your rules? Now, I assume you're referring to the Rodney rules, which I left somewhere around here. Is there a line that people have crossed that made you feel you had to respond? Interesting question. I've got to rely on my memory here to see if I can come up with some good answers. I have a couple of things I want to say. For example, I've had a couple of comments back when my kids were on the channel more regularly that were just obscene related to them. Uh, no, I didn't feel the need to respond. I deleted them and got on with my life because those people were, again, I don't know them. And I, I want to assume there's just something wrong with them, something broken in some way. And so dignifying it with a response isn't really going to achieve anything because there's something so wrong with them, a conversation from an internet stranger isn't going to really change anything. Um, I'm trying to think if I've ever... Yeah, I mean, I remember, I remember uh, seeing one commenter say something mean to another commenter in the comments of one of my videos, and I felt like I wanted to step in and say something on the original commenter's behalf and just indicate, look, like, the way you're, the way, the way you're talking to this other person is not the way that we talk here on this channel. Uh, yes, there's freedom of speech and all that, but on my channel, my rules. <laughs> and so my rules are we have to talk with respect to one another. And if you're not able to do that, then your comments will be deleted and you'll ultimately be blocked from the channel. The thing is, though, I don't, I don't typically feel it's a good investment of my time to try to debate with an internet stranger. If they're exhibiting behaviors that I think are not productive, that are combative, that are baiting someone into an argument then I feel like, oh, I know what you're all about. That's what I kind of tell myself in my own head. I know what you're looking for. That's not what I'm offering. Delete. And I just delete their comment or I, I block them if I see them exhibiting that kind of behavior. Now, if I was in person with people and I saw someone exhibiting negative behavior, hopefully I would have the courage and the quality of character to say something and address it in that situation because you can't simply just delete a comment in a real life situation. And sometimes you see these sort of things online. I, uh, I don't tend to debate with people on my own behalf, but I will sometimes step in and say things on other people's behalf when I see it happening online. Um, I can't think of any good examples right now, but I know it's, I know it's happened. Um, generally, it's when I see other media creators and someone saying something negative about them or uh, assessing the quality of their character, or if I think it's unfair, or if I think I know that person better, then I'll step in and say something then. Yeah. So hopefully that answers your, your question in some way. Uh, my rules, my Rodney rules, tend to, to relate more to dealing with people on my channel and within my little sort of nucleus and world. And my general way of dealing with that is to delete and move on. I just try not to give anyone power over how I feel, how I internalize about myself. If someone has something thoughtful, it's a relative, like a, a relevant critique, and it's expressed in a kind way or thoughtful way, Okay, that's one thing. They're just being mean or mean-spirited or I don't believe they're talking in good faith. I move on with my day. 
All right, John Miner. I've seen you play Small World. Have you ever played Small World Realms? No, I have not. Kabuki Kid, what are the books behind your head? The books that you were seeing behind my head, I think, in the other shot, those would have been Dungeons & Dragons role-playing game books. Uh, there was also Sp Amazing Spider-Man issue 129 there, which was the first appearance of the Punisher, which was a gift from some dear friends of mine. Casey Pierce would like to know, Matthew Jude and David, sorry, Dave Luza recently did a live review of a game. Would you ever consider doing a live teach? Well, I have done some live teaches, actually. If you go on to Game Night on their channel, I've done f six or seven appearances with them, and maybe four or five of those games, I taught kind of on the spur of the moment, right there with no sort of breaks, no editing. And uh, that's definitely a lot more stressful because to me it's very important to teach all of the rules and not make mistakes. I really want the viewer to kind of have all the knowledge. And so uh, it's a greater challenge, but I, I like doing it. It's, um, I like stretching myself and that certainly does do that. Kabuki Kid, did you have that Punisher first appearance graded or did you buy it already graded? Friends of mine bought it for me and it was already pre-graded and that's how it, how it came. Christopher Thomas, do you believe reviewers and influencers have too big of an impact on board games? Thinking of recent shut up and sit down praises selling out games. Too big of an impact. That's a tough one to answer. I'm not sure what that would mean exactly, too big. Like, do I think that people can have an influence on the purchasing decisions of other people? Yes. Um, you know, it happens to me all the time. I, what if one of my friends says, hey, I think this game is great. I'm really enjoying playing it. It makes me more inclined to want to buy it. And I think that's the impact that reviewers can have on people. I'm sure my videos, when I show how a game is played, if the components look good and interesting to you, then they might make you want to buy the game, right? But I don't know what, what having too much of an influence would, would mean exactly because my hope is that the person who's watching the content or the video isn't turning off their brain, you know, that they're going, okay, yes, that looks appealing to me, but hopefully it's appealing to me as a viewer, not because this other person's saying it's great, do I think it looks great? Because at the end of the day, we all kind of have to step off the ledge and decide where to put our money. And it's not really anyone else's fault if we decide something looks good and then we go buy it. Like, shut up and sit down, watch it played. We can't sort of force ourselves <laughs> into, your, um, into your brain. You choose to watch, you choose to listen, you choose to hopefully give some weight or not to those comments based on your past experience with the things that we make, hopefully. Uh, and uh, hopefully, more often than not, than not, that leads you in a, in a good direction. I don't know if that answers your question, but hopefully it does. <laughs> so I'm gonna say, first of all, happy pink t-shirt day. I wish I'd known that. I would have worn a pink t-shirt. I don't have a pink t-shirt. I might have a pinkish button-up shirt. Does that qualify? does, I could run up and grab it. It's more orangey than pink though. Hmm, I don't know that I actually have a pink shirt. All right, Echo Echo would like to know, favorite game you saw on your trip, the trip to Cannes? The favorite game I saw was Monumental from Fun Forge Game, which is delivering now. It's been a long protracted <laughs> process getting that game delivered. It's by Matthew Dunstan, a guy I really like and a, a clever designer. And that one to me looked like an amazing game. Didn't play it though, don't take my word for it. Who knows, <laughs> but I'm very keen to try it. Uh, Yannick Samard says, As-tu l'intention d'emprendre la français? I'm not sure exactly. I think that's, you're asking, do I have the intention of learning French? Uh, no. Je ne, parle, je ne parle pas français. Uh, man, man, peu. Man, très mal. <laughs> My French is not, not good. Not good at all. Casey Pearson would like to know, what color should I paint my hero's cape in Clank Legacy? Well, it's pink shirt day, so I guess today, if you're painting it, you should paint it pink. Kabuki Kid, were you put up at Tom's house or a hotel while in Florida? I was in, the, in a hotel, a nearby hotel. I just sort of flew in one day, got in there late at night. The next day, they picked me up, brought me in. We shot all day long, and then I went home the next day. Very, very quick, very quick trip. Jennifer Sims, have you heard about the Kool-Aid Man expansion for Funkoverse? He can bust through walls. What are your thoughts on that? I heard about it and I saw a picture. I don't know anything more beyond that, actually. So I, I think they're doing some fun things with the Funkoverse. I was always somebody uh, who never liked mixing universes in the games that I played. I softened on that somewhat. So like the fact that you can have the Golden Girls go up against the Kool-Aid man, sure, why, why not? 
Wayne Robinson sa says, can you name a few new legacy games that sound good and are coming out? Uh, I could if I was better at my job. <laughs> I, I feel like these days I'm looking about this far ahead of me in terms of games that are coming out. I'm sort of working on the next videos that I'm working on and if it's not something I'm actively working on, I'm not really looking down the line to see what games are coming out. Does that make me a bad media creator? I don't know. I, I um, Well, I know the answer to that. No, it doesn't make me a bad media creator. That's just the kind of person I am. I used to pay more attention to the new games that were coming out. I still pay some attention to it, of course, but I don't feel like I have the same kind of encyclopedic knowledge. There was a time where I could have listed off to you, here's the war games that are coming out, here's the miniatures games that are coming out, here's the legacy games that are coming out. I know, for example, we've got a, um, a new, probably a new pandemic legacy game coming out at some point in the future. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Al Wilkinson would like to know, how long does it typically take to render one of your tutorials? Do you have to render them overnight? No, it takes about an hour and a half, maybe, for a, a longer, a longish one. Radisson would like to know, do you think we'll have a shortage of new releases considering the situation with the virus in China spreading rapidly around the world in the next months? You know, it is spreading. I, I don't want to add to the fear mongering, not because I don't think we shouldn't be concerned about it, but... Um, you know, uh, right now, of course, you're still more likely to be killed by a car than, say, this, this virus. But this virus is serious, and it is having an impact, and it is going to have an impact on game production. Games are already be being delayed in their production because of the virus, because a lot of these games are manufactured in China, and they've actually shut down factories and told people don't come in to work. And so because of that, yes, there will definitely be delays. But the, the biggest thing here, of course, is that people's health and safety is prioritized. So I hope games are delayed if it means keeping this under control and getting people the help that they need. Kubiki Kid, do you have an opinion on Asmodee saying they will no longer offer replacement parts for their games to customers? Again, if I was a better media creator, I would. <laughs> I, I did hear about this, but I, this kind of happened while I was traveling, so I, it wasn't something I was seeing all the, the banter about, so I don't really know all the nitty gritty details. It's, on the one hand, I can empathize with people going like, well, that's disappointing, because it was nice to be able to go and get a replacement part. On the other hand, there aren't like a lot of products where you can just order individual pieces if something goes missing, or like if you just lose something. Yeah, I remember I had a copy of Space Hulk, third edition. This was, gosh, this was around. This was around. This was before actually, before I shot the Space Hulk, Space Hulk playthrough, which was in 2012 maybe or 13. Anyway, I was um, missing a piece, and yes, I contacted them, and yes, they sent me a little sprue with, with the pieces on it, but um, I don't know. I think Asmodee is probably making a business decision that makes sense. Does it help the consumer? Probably not, but it looks like they're still offering a replacement program, which is, hey, if you buy something and something is wrong with it, you return it to the place you bought it from and you get a replacement, which is how we do most purchases these days, right? Alexandre Robert writes, what theme that hasn't been exploited would you like to see in a new game? I'm going to answer your question in a way that probably isn't very satisfying. I don't have a particular theme that I'm keen to see uh, used in a game. Um, what I like is seeing a good marriage between the theme and the mechanisms of the game. I love when a game has you doing things that feel like even if it's abstracted, a little bit of a simulation of the theme, you know, sort of, sort of coming to life. Uh, there was a game, Fuji Koro, that had a crafting element in the game where you would take resources and then craft them into weapons, armor, and that sort of thing. There were little blocks. You would get the resources, wood, like a brown block, or steel, like a gray block, and you would literally put them out on your board in the shape of the weapon you were crafting. So you were physically, you were really actually crafting them. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was really cool. I thought that was a really awesome aspect of the game. I love when a theme marries what you're doing to the theme. That is what I like to see, if we want to call it exploited. That's what I like to see exploited in games. All right. Last Seer asks, what's the best twist on a standard mechanic that you've seen lately? I don't know. I cannot... Let me think. Oh, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll mention one thing. I don't... This is the best twist. I don't know if this is the best twist, but this is a twist I saw that I thought was pretty clever. So that game Monumental from Matthew Dunstan coming from Funforge. You have your cards. What you have to do is you have to put a nine-card grid face down in front of you. Three by three, I think it was. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Right? 
And on your turn, you pick a row and a column of those three. And then you get to use a certain number of those cards within that row and column. Actually, I think you get to use all the cards in the row and all the cards in the column. And so what, what I thought was clever about this is you don't get to use all the things. You have to use these, these two intersections. And then, but what you can do, you see, is you can then cra you can craft for the next turn. I know I'm removing these ones. I know I'm leaving these four cards behind. So when I refill this, hopefully I'm going to continue building towards this really great hand later. I'm not sure if I'm explaining it well, but if I know, for example, hey, this card is really great, but I know there's a card in my deck that would pair really well with it. Well, I'm not going to use that card this turn. I'm going to use this row and column that leaves it on the table, and then hopefully I'm going to draw into that later, and it's going to fill in into this position I want. So when I grab that row and column later, now it's going to be even more powerful. Again, a little bit hard to get across here in conversation without showing you on the table, but I thought it was a really clever idea, and I had, didn't feel like I'd seen it done before. Canadian rye whiskey or Kentucky bourbon? Canadian rye whiskey, says uh, that's to Christopher Thomas. Wow, we are five minutes to go and the questions, I am not even close. <laughs> and all I've been doing is answering questions. Great questions, everyone, by the way. Uh, I hope you're enjoying some of the answers here. Okay, so Jack will let you know, how do I get the guys who come over for game night to wash their hands after they use the bathroom? I put out clean towels every time and they end up unused. What is up with that? Well, unfortunately, when people have bad habits, they don't get broken just because game night's happening. Uh, my tip would be to put a note. Um, put a note on the back of the door before they leave, a note by the, the sink, and say, please, please wash. Um, that's probably the most passive way, or maybe even passive-aggressive way of dealing with it. The other way, of course, is just to remind people verbally to do it, um, which I know can create some uncomfortable situations, but beyond that, what can you do? I suppose you could have them wash their hands as soon as they get back from the bathroom. Hey, there's a sink over there in the kitchen. Go wash your hands. I don't know. It depends on how much you, <laughs> you really want to enforce it. Uh, Benjamin Nicholson would like to know, do Marty and Tony have you scheduled to come on Rolling Dice and Taking Names? Well, we often at Gen Con will have some kind of crossover there because we're in the same area together, and we might try to do that again this year. We'll, we'll see. Again, that show is so crazy busy. It's, it's a hard one even for fun collaborations with friends. Okay. Benjamin Nicholson would like to know, what lawnmower do you have? The reason he's asking that, I believe, is because Marty and Tony over at Rolling Dice and Taking Names, a fantastic podcast and good friends of mine, <laughs> they get off on the weirdest su subjects sometimes in their gaming podcast, and one of their subjects is talking about lawnmowers. I actually couldn't tell you. I do mow my own lawn. I have no idea what kind of mower I have. I will need to find that out so I can answer that question. I did not expect to get it tonight. <laughs> Uh, Kabuki Kid, do you approve of the Punisher having go-go boots back in the 70s? Well, it was the 70s, so sure, I guess. <laughs> yeah, his boots were something. His costumes over the years have, have evolved. I don't mind the classic costume. It often depends on the artist uh, who's drawing. That will, will <laughs> depend on whether or not I think the costume looks better or worse. But I think uh, my favorite has been his, sort of the costume that the Garth Ennis wrote in his Max series which was more of a guy in a trench coat who then just had a shirt with a skull on it. Okay, James C., how was your trip to Florida and the Dice Tower? Do anything fun, anything surprise you? Well, I talked about that a little bit earlier in the live show, so hopefully you saw me talk about that and got those details there. So YYZ would like to know, do you ever attend any Canadian conventions such as Breakout Con in Toronto? No, I have not attended that convention. They've invited me multiple years. I've always said I'd love to come, but it always interferes. It always conflicts with another trip that I have pre-planned that I have to go to. I would like to get to more Canadian conventions. Canada has gaming conventions, and I like seeing them happen. I want to support them myself personally where possible. It's challenging. Right now, I'm already traveling pretty much once every month all year, and I have to be here making videos. So uh, I don't know that I have a lot more room in my schedule for more uh, awesome uh, conventions, but it's so great to see more and more conventions so that people who live in those local areas can go and meet up with people there, make new friends, play new games, Conventions are, I'm glad they're on the rise, and, uh, and I hope they continue to do so. Sarah Bornstein asks, when you started doing videos, did you think you would have such a great impact on the hobby? Well, uh, Sarah, thank you. I mean, by way of the question, that's kind of a compliment. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm not really sure exactly what my impact is on the hobby. Um, no, <laughs> this, is a, this is a tough question to answer. You know, someone asked me a question here. 
Cryonidas asked, what do you think will be your legacy in the board gaming world? I think this is probably a similar type of question. I think the answer to that is I can't say. That's it's not really for me to say. I really am happy to be able to do what I get to do for a living. And the reason I get to do what I do for a living is because my wife and my family supported me from the very beginning. And so many people like you watching watched and supported along the way. Um, if you hadn't, I would not still be here doing this. That is just an objective fact. And, uh, and I, so I, I just will always be filled with, with a tremendous amount of gratitude. So I don't really ever think about sort of what my impact is on the hobby per se, but the hobby and all of you have, have had a massive, massive impact on me. You really have. And again, uh, you have my undying gratitude for that. Derek S. would like to know, were you born in Canada? If so, where? I was born in Canada. Uh, I was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and that's where I lived most of my life, actually. We moved to Prince Edward Island a little over 10 years ago now, and I loved Halifax. Um, and if, you know, if I was going to move again sometime in the future, I don't have any plans to, Halifax is certainly somewhere I would consider going back to. John Miner asks, when should we expect a vlog? <laughs> We've got to get to 100. You're right, John. Look, it's, it's been a little crazy, a little busy. Not complaining, it's great to be busy. I'm happy to be, be busy, but it has meant the vlog has suffered a little bit. But I have shot some more content for the vlog. So if I get some downtime, I will try to edit it together. I shot some content while I was at Cannes, and I'd love to be able to share that with you as soon as I get a chance. I still plan to get to 100 episodes in that vlog. I don't care if I have to do one episode a year. Okay, well that means I have to live another 50 years, so. Well, I hope that happens, but either way, I will get there. I will get there. This will not die. All right, I'm, we're at time now, so technically I need to stop. I will try to speed round these next few questions. I'll try to get through a few more. Wolvi Zandaleri asks, have you seen anything on Times of Legends Destinies? I have, I got a quick little demonstration at Gen Con from the gang there. It looks really cool, really interesting. I like both those companies that are involved, so hopefully it translates into a really great game. Board Game Trucker writes, how has life changed in general with BGG employment over the course of your time responsibilities at work? Well, I'm not really employed by BGG. I understand people asking that question, maybe thinking that. It's more of a collaborative partnership. So Watch a Play is still a separate entity. BGG is still a separate ent entity, but we do things together, certainly. Um, and, uh, and it's been great. I have, I have no real complaints about the collaboration. And BGG is you know, a, a really big, and you know, talking about something that has a legacy in the hobby. Board Game Geek has a, a big impact and legacy in the hobby. You know how I know? Watch when the Board Game Geek website goes down for a few minutes. <laughs> I know it affects me drastically. <laughs> I think it affects a lot of people. It's also like a great community. It's where I really kind of grew Watch It Played. Yes, Watch It Played was on YouTube. That's a needle in a, I'm a needle in a haystack over on Watch It Played. On BGG, that's where the gamers are, right? That's where people who would be looking for the kind of content that I create could find me. So it's, it's Board Game Geek is, is massively influential. It's been hugely helpful to a lot of people, especially people like myself who make uh, board game media. Okay, I want to take a quick moment and I want to thank Andrea for all the help she's been giving me collating your questions together. It's made it a lot easier. I haven't had to sort of sift through everything to find the questions. All right, I'm going to now try to answer the last few questions that she's put on this page for me and that's it. It's going to end soon. So don't ask any more questions or you'll be disappointed. Sorry if there's questions I didn't get to, but I'm going to do my best to get to these ones that I still have. Okay, James C. Favorite game that no one else seems to like as much as you? That's tough because I think the games that I like, I'm just quickly scanning my shelf here, are games that a lot of other people like. I don't think I have a, a, a particular game that I like that, you know, is, is just obscure. Um, I'm going to look at my other shelves. Sorry, I'm disappearing for a second. I just want to make sure there's not some obscure game on my shelf here that I'm forgetting about. Um... What's, what's the one I'm looking for? Oh yeah, Blood Bowl Team Manager, the card game. I'm not saying that's a game that not other people like, because a lot of people do like that game, but um, I don't hear it talked about so much, and it's a game that I just really like, and uh, wish I could play more often. It's why I should try to break out and play this year, with that in mind. What's your go-to person to learn games from when you don't get it? <laughs> Sorry, who's your go-to person? This is a question from Derek S. You know, I, um, I'm not trying to, like, exclude other people, but I, I go to the rule book, and then if I can't get the answer there, I am in the fortunate position that I typically can go to the publisher with my questions, or I go to Board Game Geek. 
And so, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's typically where I learn my games. You know, uh, one of my favorite people to learn games from is Don. Don is um, someone I know through the Sierra Cabal Gaming Podcast. He's a co-host on there now, which he's excellent as a co-host. He's a recent addition to the show. But I've been taught games by him before at different conventions, and he is fantastic. He's a great teacher of games. Yonzo Rabi, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, asks, have you ever played D&D? Would you ever try to do a tutorial about it? That actually is similar to another question someone asked here. So I'm sort of getting two questions answered at once. Um, I have played D&D once, maybe twice. Would I ever try to do a tutorial for it? Yes, I've thought about it in the past. It's actually something I wanted to do. Just haven't, haven't gotten to it. <laughs> I think it's because I don't play a lot of role-playing games. I would prefer to play something like D&D a bunch before I ever try to do a proper tutorial for it. Jessica Smith, what is your favorite place you have visited for board game work purposes? I think I'm going to have to say can. I know that was the place I was most recently visiting. But as a city and an area, wow. Was it ever beautiful? Uh, had historical... Um, you know, historical sites to go see. The temperature was amazing. It was like my favorite temperature. It was sort of like a fall temperature here in Canada. And it was sunny every day. Loved it. I mean, it would be a toss up between that and when I went to Germany and did that amazing tour with Joseph Knit, which you'll find videos for on my channel. It's like a, there's like a 10 episode, basically vlog, of us traipsing around Germany. It was really a, a great experience. All right. Sar Bornstein would like to know, right now, what board game are you really eager to play again? Uh, Blitzkrieg is one I'm really eager to play again. The Godfather Corleone's Empire, Paranormal Detectives. Just kind of looking at my shelves here, seeing what things are kind of like jumping out at me and stuff I'd really like to play again. Um, Concordia. I haven't played the Venus expansion. I've had it for over a year. I'd really like to play that again. Oh, there's a bunch. Root. I like to play Root again. <laughs> so many games. Ah, Terraforming Mars, did I mention that? Always up for playing Terraforming Mars. Okay. Uh, Kurusu. Advice for when people, fam and this is the last question, advice for when people, family members, who would rather play the same old tired games than learn new ones. I'm getting frustrated at the ones I bring almost always being ignored. Oh, this is a tough one. This is a tough one because I empathize with your desire, but I'm not sure if it's a desire that you should have fulfilled. <laughs> How do I put this? Um, gaming is a social experience where for it to work, really, everyone at the table sort of needs to mostly be on the same page. You don't have to have perfect simpatico, of course. Everyone's gonna have little desires, individual desires that are gonna tug and pull it what's going to be possible uh, in terms of getting everyone on the same page. But if the majority of your family members would rather play, rather, rather than call them the same old tired games, let's call them the games that they're familiar with, that they know they already enjoy, then that's the games that you should be playing with them because those are the ones that they want to play. And gaming is a hobby. It's not like eating your vegetables, which you should do, <laughs> even if you don't want to. Uh, it's, it's a, you know, it's a hobby. It's, it'd be sort of like saying, hey, I love golfing, but none of my friends want to go golfing with me. How do I make them? Um, you don't, because maybe they just don't want to golf. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that your desires aren't important as well. Uh, so, but I would, try to th I would try to find another way to solve them, which is maybe you need to find a different group of people to play those games with. Maybe you need to see if there's a game group locally that you can, you can either create or find that's already established that maybe is more ravenous for those new games and then try to hook up with them and play those there. But I do, I do strongly caution against pushing people into games that they don't, just don't want to play because it won't be fun for them and that will mean it won't be fun for you either. Even though you're playing this new game you want to play, if they're all miserable, that will probably make the experience less enjoyable for you. I hope those words kind of make sense. Hopefully that's... A, kind of a useful piece of advice. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, look, we've done it. We've come to the end of, we've come to the end. Oh, um, so I just see a follow-up comment here. It's not really a majority of my family. It's one leader that steamrolls. They know the other games I play. Well, in, in that case, let me just modify my answer slightly. If it's just one player, is there a way to not kick them out, 
but go like, look, I know you, you don't really want to play these new games, but I, I would like to try playing these games with these folks. So let's do that. Or I don't know if you live at home with your family or not. Maybe you can have a different day where you don't invite that person. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the family politics are, if that would be possible or not. But maybe you play the, 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 the older games, the more familiar games with that person one night. And then the other night you go, this is, I know this is going to be your cup of tea. So I'm just bringing over the people who might be more open to it. You know, maybe that's an option. I don't know. Tough situation, I know. Maybe not an easy answer, especially since I'm not there in person, but hopefully something in there was helpful. All right, now, here's the challenge we have. I've got to end this stream, and I've got to do it in new software that YouTube has created, and I don't know how to do it. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> We're going to find out right now. I'm going to do my best to end the stream smoothly. Let's see if I can. First of all, the, oh, what am I talking about? We have a contest. I have to give away. <laughs> I have to give away something before we can leave. Oh my goodness. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. We're going to do this right now. We have a copy of The Mind. We are going to give this away right now. We're going to give it away to somebody. Here, I'm going to draw a winner. Are you ready? Drawing winner now. The winner is... Wow, it's number one. It is Matt. Congratulations, Matt. You are the winner. We're going to save that winner. I will send you an email probably soon after the stream is over just to get your mailing address, and I'll try to get this out to you this week. We'll see but I will get it out to you. Congratulations. And all of you, I want to thank you again for joining me on the live stream. I feel like I'm talking a mile a minute. I hope you can keep up. I will maybe try in the future to slow it down a little bit so it doesn't seem so frenetic and crazy. I don't know if I can. I don't know if I'm capable of that, but we'll try. Again, thank you for joining me. And as always, thanks for watching.